Hello, my friends. This is Deepak here, and we are continuing our conversations with influencers and luminaries and all the stuff we talk about, science, philosophy, spirituality, human uh, relationships, the human condition, the condition of the planet. And today, it's my great privilege and honor to actually uh, speak to a person that I admire a lot, a great uh, visionary, uh, somebody who's uh, achieved extraordinary things in his life and is now focusing on something that we all need to understand. And that's called understanding, understanding. If you look at this book, uh, I've been going through it in the last few weeks and it's all about the human desire to find explanations for just about everything they experience. And in that context, there's a new, um, there's a new um, institute that will soon be coming called the Werman Center for Understanding Understanding. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but let me introduce to you Richard Saul Werman, our very special guest. Uh, Richard, thanks for joining me and giving me this privilege. Um, well, it's uh, an honor because uh, you're above the radar and I'm below the radar and those of us below the radar are always grasping at that, that bar to peek our head and see what it's like above the radar. And so now I see you today, Deepak, and that's a pleasure. However, you broke a couple of my rules when you introduced me. First of all, uh, I never talk about my books when I give a speech. But I'm allowed to. Nobody's allowed. I don't, I don't think, I, I think there, there's a, an obligation, a, a, it's a privilege and an obligation when you speak to the public, uh, to my audiences when I give a speech. I never talk about my books because I don't want to be thought of as a bookseller. And I never let people even talk about a charity, even if it's a good charity, because they're selling. I think these converses, having a conversation is amazing. I think the complexity of a conversation, the freedom, the love, the, the hate, the a good conversation is like Carlos Gardel was a great Argentinian who celebrated in Argentina. Some of you don't know him. If you're Argentinian, you do. And he invented the music, created the music, and the description and the, the rules for a dance called the tango. And the tango is an amazing metaphor for this conversation. Or when I say this, I mean metaphorically this conversation. Because a tango has love in it and hate. It has touching people with great feeling and it's purposely sometimes you don't touch each other. There's improvisation and there's set roles in it. It's a dance made up of radical alternatives. It's a Dance made up like a joke, because the punchline of a joke is the opposite of expectation. And radical alternatives are often where we get new thoughts and new visions of things. Uh, Isaac Robby, who got a Nobel Prize, came over to this country, uh, his family, and settled in 1899 in Chicago. And in his Nobel speech, he told this story. He said, when my friends went to school and came home every day, their mothers asked them, what did the teacher teach them today? What did they learn in school? That's an obvious thing. That's a normal thing. His mother said, Izzy, Izzy, did you ask any good questions today? He said, it's because of my mother telling me that that I now have the Nobel Prize. But so, Richard, let me respond. Sure. So 
There's a great poet, I forget his name right now. He said, if you live the questions, that's enough. You don't need to know the answers. So I totally agree with you. And, and we're just going back, we're going back to Socrates. That was Socrates whole yeah. thing. Yeah. I said nothing new then. Einstein to Socrates or Socrates to Einstein always believed in, in the, the question and not so much the answer. So and let me ask you a few so questions. The product. I believe Let me in ask you a few questions. Let's start sure. with that. Okay. I want all the people who are watching us right now to let, know a little bit more about Richard Saul Werman, where he was born, what was his family like, what was his childhood like, teenage years, a little bit more about your intimate self to start with before we talk about understanding, understanding. Well, I know, I, I know the facts of where I was born. Good. I know the facts of where I lived, uh, uh, but I have, I can, I can speak from myself of my first memory. Yeah, and you're in, uh, who is- That's the only thing I know myself. Everything else was told me. Yeah. So, so we know, we know how we measure what, is, what we're told by people. It can be the truth or not. So my only truth, my truth, my only truth is my first memory. So my first memory is I was four years old and I was visiting the uh, Paris Fair at the 1939 World's Fair. And I went up a very narrow escalator and I looked down on the city of the future. And then I went down the escalator and that the memory disappears. Now, the facts that I've been told is that I was born in, in 1935, which by the way, is the year that Carlos Gardel died. And it's the year that the Volkswagen was first done. And it's the year that the Toyota was first made. So the two people, the two countries that we were at war with uh, did a people's car in the same year so I was born in 1935 at a hospital called uh, the Jewish Hospital. It's now called the Albert Einstein Hospital Northern Division. They got rid of Jewish and they named it for Albert Einstein, who was Jewish, but represented smart Jews, I guess. And uh, it was the very Northern part of uh, Philadelphia, which is now quite a slum. I was born on a street called Virginian Road. And then we moved when I was months old to another street called 17th Street. And I lived at 5717 North 17th Street, which was semi crummy, a semi detached house. And um, I went to kindergarten in a school called Pennell School. Um, and I have some stories about my kindergarten. And then I, we moved to the slurbs or the suburbs, the close suburbs of Philadelphia. Now, both sides of my family uh, were uh, dealt in death. Uh, my mother's side were kosher butchers, so they killed chickens. And my father's side made cigars, which killed people. Uh, so they both, neither one uh, uh, educated in the sense of going to college or even having the remote opportunity of going to college. Um, I was closer to my father than my mother. And my father had no idea of what I did, but he gave me permission to be me. I think that was special. It came up a couple times in my life that people who were important to me, that their greatest contribution, one in particular, was allowing me to be more of myself, not follow his footsteps, not follow his style, not follow his dress, but allowed me to be me. And it helped make me me and it, I owe him and my father for the major decisions in my life. How about your teen memories? Any interesting <clears throat> memories from your teen years? <clears throat> I have spoken, not recently, because they're all dead, I'm 86. So all my friends, the people who are, except one, one has called me recently 
after 50 years because he's in Florida and has been following me all these years, but never had the, the gumption to call me. And he finally called me on the phone. In fact, I just got an email, email from him this morning, uh, but I haven't seen him. He sent me his picture and he lives not too far away, but I have no interest in meeting anybody else in my life, actually. Um, uh, COVID has been okay because when I lived, I just lived in Florida for four, four and a half years now. And I lived in Newport for 22 years. And the only thing they have in common is I never knew the names of the people who were my neighbors. Uh, that's the same when I lived in an apartment house. I didn't know the people on the floor or those above me or below me. Uh, I have met enough people because of what I do and I, I like to select the people I know rather than have it by custom and proximity. So I select talking to you and inviting you to speak at one of my gatherings, uh, but you never live next door. Um, my teenage years is uh, I, don't, I don't like to go to the movie theaters. Uh, I don't like any place I have to be. And I don't like having to get up and pee. Uh, so my friends went to, I had a few friends, only very few. The same as now. I say I have five friends and I can only name four of them. Uh, not because that one is, uh, I don't want to tell you his name. I can't remember who it is. And so I like to say five because I can put up my hand but I might only have four good friends. Um, I have a lot of acquaintances. You are an acquaintance. You're not one of my closest friends, but you're an acquaintance. You know, I wouldn't ask you for a kidney transplant, uh, which they say is one of the measures of a close friend. Um, I don't think I would ask any of my close friends for a kidney transplant either, but that's they say as a measure. I've read that that's a measure of a close friend. But I had, I had several close friends. Uh, I was always abrasively charming. Um, I was always, I always did okay at school, A minus, B plus. I wasn't the smartest person in school. Uh, the teachers knew that I knew. Now, what I mean by this, and this will offend most of the people listening, is I knew they were teachers because they couldn't do something better or more. Everyone was a teacher because it was steps down from their dream. Um, they knew I knew that. I never told them, but they knew I knew. Um, I've been told by these people a few years ago who were alive from my kindergarten through through uh, 12th grade, that the thing that they thought was extremely different about me than themselves and the other people they knew from my high school, junior high school class, is that every one of them, themselves included, they've observed themselves and the others changing from kindergarten and that I never changed. That the way I am now, which is, you know how I am now, and it it goes with the fact of how of, of my my whole gestalt, my whole thing. It was strange for a kindergarten person to be that way. So, so as I look at this uh, Werman Center for Understanding Understanding, uh, what I see here is that you were already talking about technology entertainment and design in 1971. And I recall that in 1971, I was struggling in turn in Boston <laughs> at uh, the Joslin Clinic and uh, other Leahy Clinic and medical schools over there. I was still struggling to find myself. And you had already written about um, technology and entertainment and design. Uh, Share, well, with did, me. Share with me a I little bit. My, the first book I did when I was 26 is a, is a cult book. I did two books at 20 years of 26. I mean, I, I don't think I'd give anybody the time of day if they walked in my office at 26. The first book ever done on Louis Kahn, the very famous architect, 
he allowed me to do. And it was my first book and the first book ever done on him. The first book he gave permission to be done on him. And I did that book. It just went through a Kickstarter, made the Kickstarter. It's coming out from, it's going to be in facsimile. It was a very beautifully printed linen book with gold stamping on it. And it was the notebooks and drawings that showed his process. He allowed me to pick out the drawings. He allowed me to do the book. He never saw it till it was printed. And according to his son and others, it was the most favorite book of his that was done before he died. And it's the last thing he bought two copies of the book on the way to the airport to India. And then home, he died in the train station in New York City. So it was the last thing he bought. And we have the receipt from the bookstore. Uh, so I was in 1962 and three, or 62, I think it came out. Also that year or the next year, I did a series with my students then of models out of plasticine of 50 cities all to the same scale. It was the first comparative, it was the first time anybody had ever done maps of cities to the same scale. I saw that. Yeah. I thought many people must have done that. It's such an obvious idea because we only understand something relative to something we understand. We, we don't understand anything out of context. We can't understand it. You have to have a person next to it or a pencil next to it or something or a city at this. With, so no two cities in the world do their maps to the same scale or with the same legends. So it's full of, I don't know what words I can use. Can I use curse words here? Yeah, you can just say anything. Okay, people are full of shit. That's not a bad curse word. When they when they are city planners and they're comparing cities when they don't have comparative information, it's all collected differently, different level of accuracy, different names. In one city, an airport is called open space. Another, it's called transportation. In another state, it's called public land. In other states, it's called airports. I mean. Every legend is different, so you can't compare anything. You can't compare successes on some program of crime or where police stations are located or, or a level of income to another city who maybe doesn't collect that or collects it in a different way or never collects it together. Does crime occur near police stations or does no crime occur near a police station? Does crime occur on the pathways where you go from poor neighborhoods to rich neighborhoods or to shopping center. What were the things you would like to know? What patterns would you like to know? You can only know them if you know them comparatively. Okay, I did that in 62. So yes, I've always been, why I am more powerful than you, even though you're more famous, have written maybe not as many books, but more popular books, because I don't try to sell mine. When mine go out of print, I don't reprint any book. Uh, they just, I grind them up. Whatever's left is ground up after two years. So I don't collect things. I'm more powerful because I'm more in touch with my ignorance. Now, maybe you're going to say, no, 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 Richard, I'm more in touch with my ignorance than you are. Maybe you are. It's my way of provoking you and everybody else. Because I start from not knowing. I don't write about my expertise. I won't do a book if I know what the book is if I know the subject. If I did a cookbook about Southwest cooking, I would do it because it's interesting and I don't know anything about it. And I think that would be a good book because the book would be my journey from not knowing to knowing. The person who would get the advance would be the person who runs the most successful Southwest cooking restaurant in Santa Fe because she'd be selling her expertise. I sell to you the bigger you, my ignorance. Okay, so may I respond? If you don't hold up my books, I don't like seeing my books. I'm you can respond. Okay. I'm only holding. The... I'm proud of this center. I'm proud of this center. Okay. But this, the center is really about, let me tell you one more thing and then you can hold it up. You can do whatever you want with it. I beg your pardon. I apologize. You should hold it up. Right. Okay. The center is my observation that. I don't understand my doctor. I don't understand my lawyer. I don't understand the person who fixes my car. I don't understand uh, 
anybody that does anything for me in a professional sense or in a service sense, because we've never learned to explain things. And after explaining is understanding, but there's no course in how to make a good phone call. You have a lot of lousy phone calls probably. You have a lot, some conversations and people don't know how to converse. We've never been taught the structure of a good conversation. The structure of a good speech is not being a good speaker. It's them sensing you have a story to tell and it's your truth. Okay, may I respond? Oh, you never have to ask me. Just interrupt me because I don't mind being interrupted. No, no, I don't like to interrupt. I, but I don't uh, mind. I'm telling you I don't yeah. mind. Okay, so now let me respond since you said what you said. So this is where I am in my life. I'm about 11 years younger than you are. So I've, I'm still learning. See, I and, thought you were much, much younger. No, I'm only, I'm 74. So here's what I know and what I don't know. Let me tell you what I first don't know. I don't know who I am beyond the name I was given or the form that you see. I don't know who I am. Mm -hmm. I don't know who you are beyond your name and form in the deeper reality. I don't know the nature of any object that I see other than what it's called. Bottom line, I don't know anything except one thing, maybe two things. One is there is existence. And by that, I mean anything that we perceive as existence. And the second thing I know is that I also exist. There is existence. And second thing is I exist. Outside of that, everything is a story. It's a human story. We make it up. And whether it's a scientific story or a mythological story or a religious story or a historical story, it's still a story. And stories are not fundamental reality. So I totally agree with you that Socrates, whoever he was, or Plato called him that, when he said, the one thing I know is that I don't know, but I do know one thing, I exist. Okay. I think, therefore I am. No, the other way, I am, therefore I think. Oh, that's okay too. You can join my club. Okay. That's a big deal, that's an honor. I don't have many people in my club. Okay, so <laughs> thank you for inviting me to your club. Now, now let's, get to, let's get to the next step because that's why I'm having this conversation with you. Why do humans have the need for explanation? Does, first of all, any other species have that other than Homo sapiens? And are our explanations valid? Or are they just another model of what we don't know? That question has several levels. In one, you know, philosophical level, if we, sitting quietly and, and watching the moths go into the light bulbs. We would have it one way. And the other way is a very practical, dumb and dirty, realistic way is, uh, I would like to, if something's wrong with me, I'd like to have it explained or if somebody is gonna treat me for something, I would like to have it explained so I could understand. That's a very quiet statement. And it's because at this moment in history, and probably it will continue for a while, our lives have gotten, they get more complex with the more things we, not only I'm talking about technological complexity, they just get more complex as uh, we have access to some information that we can understand, some information that we call information that doesn't inform, so we can't call it information and some questions that don't have a quest, so we can't call them questions. So I'm interested in the informed quest. I'm interested in taking my car in that does, and, and knowing what they're doing to it and why they have to do it, do it or, or is it all hocus pocus? Uh, I'm certainly, I'm interested in my finances. I work with a very large, I have enough money that I have 
somebody that manages my money. And I said, I want to know the person I, for each thing I own, whether it's a bond or a stock, I would like to know who I call their phone number. Uh, I would like to know the name of the thing and its number, if there's an identifying number to it, and they usually have very long identifying numbers. I would like to know if it's, if it's multiple shares, how many shares it is, what it was worth last month, what it's worth this month, and in groups of liquidity, how liquid are the various things that I have. My house, for instance, is a major part of my estate, but it's not liquid. So what is what are things worth? And I can do that, and I designed one piece of paper, printed both sides, even one side upside down so you can look at it and flip it. And it's been a year they're working on how to do that because what they send me is their printouts that I can't understand whatsoever. That's a simple, practical thing. But it is, it is the poster child for our lack of understanding of fundamentals, medical fundamentals. There's only five subjects, health, wealth, learning, public discourse and public and the environment. And we don't have access to understand any of those. And so we are live in a state of fooling ourselves. Now I know in the sense of your, of your spiritual sense, everything you said is true. We are only us, we don't know anything else. There's these things, I, under, I, I, I think I have a sense of that. I probably don't understand it in the same way you do, but that's fine. Maybe part of your thing is we each understand what you just said in a different way. That's okay with me too. But in the arc of things, I believe that in the day-to-day -day activities, you know, I would like to know how to turn on my television set. I'm uh, speaking to Richard Saul Werman, and uh, we are also, amongst other things, talking about the upcoming center, the Werman Center for Understanding Understanding. And I'm looking through the brochure, and it's very obvious that uh, the center seeks to make the complex clear in five areas, which uh, Richard just mentioned. Learning, understanding conversation, dialogue and public discourse, health, understanding well-being and human embodiment. I like that word, embodiment, because I think in the deeper reality, there's no such thing, although we experience it. Well, well so you uh, like it so you can tell me that, right? Yeah, I like <laughs> it. <laughs> Then wealth, which Richard just spoke about, understanding business performance and finance, conflict, understanding global relationships, including hostility, antipathy, and violence, and environment, understanding nature, topology, and interdependence. And as I look through Richard's career or life, he's been doing this ever since he was in his 20s. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, technology, entertainment, and design, those three words led to uh, what later became the TED organization, which you founded. Am I right on that? I created that term and I created the conference. And, and the conference- Later, you- many people, many people called me TED because they thought that was my name. Yes. And, and many people who go there have no idea what those three words, three letters mean. Right, uh, I do. But now let's yeah. go further. Then you created TED Med yeah. after that, where I actually met Rudy Tanzi for the first time. And thanks to your, your conference, he and I became buddies. We wrote three books together. We looked at epigenetics, consciousness, the hard problem of consciousness, on and on. And we become best friends. In fact, due to that conference, um, I got an appointment at Mass General as a, as a researcher because of having met Rudy at your conference. So I just want to thank you for that. And now you're on to even deeper uh, adventures with understanding, understanding those five areas you mentioned. But I would like to actually share with you something I've been talking to about other but people. I want to change one word. It's not deeper, it's dumber. It's okay. really, I'm going backwards in my life. To Whatever, find, it's but expanding. But I'm trying to find beginnings. Doesn't matter. You're expanding the conversation for all of us. So thank you. 
But what I also want to say is I'm talking to other people such as, your, such as you who are envisioning maybe a, a different reality or you call it uh, alternative reality or even reinventing the human experience. And they're talking about similar things that you are talking about, you know, the convergence of information technologies, the resurrection of a new way to create energy, fossil free. They're also talking about uh, new ways of transportation. They're talking about uh, uh, food and how do we create food without uh, killing animals and other species. And finally, even talking about how to create new materials without extracting matter from the earth by going all the way from waves and particles and atoms and molecules, innumerable minerals that we use in our technology today. So this thinking that you actually embarked on as a young person, whether you like it or not, has expanded to understand understanding, finding explanations, which is a human experience, creating the human experience of the human universe. So I just want to acknowledge that, whether you like it or not, you call yourself, you earlier <laughs> referred to yourself as charmingly aggressive. Abrasively which, charming. Uh, abrasively <laughs> charming. Some people would say abrasively charming grows up to be an old curmudgeon. <laughs> how, how would you react to that? Well, uh, are you? This is going to be an odd answer. Okay. But you have to. You can make the the little slips, the the connections. When I was in high school, I liked to paint, so I painted, and I wanted to become a painter. And my father had me tested. Uh, he would by a president of a small college who got his doctorate in testing. And at the end of two days of testing, they said my three, obviously he likes to paint, but the three things he has an aptitude for are archeology, span architecture, and hairdressing. And um, that led to several things. One, uh, I, I, I never got a haircut after that, except by myself. I've always given myself a haircut. And that was, I was 17 or so then. Um, then I went to School of Architecture at Penn and went and got a master's degree with Lou Kahn. And Lou Kahn was and is my mentor, even though he's no longer alive. Uh, he had a great effect on my life. And the third thing is I spent six months in the jungle of Guatemala, mapped a third of Tikal, the largest and the oldest of the Mayan cities. And I've kept pretty well informed on archaeology, various that whole field of archaeology, with a little sliver of anthropology. Uh, I have a lot of faults. One is I don't have great intelligence. Uh, it's not a fault; it's a lacking. Uh, yeah, my, I, my I don't I don't understand almost everything. I, I can't type, uh, which has been a great help because. I've done about 90 books and I just dictate them and they get transcribed so they're more readable because they're not worked over by writing and they're my conversations. And I think we, our conversations are more understandable often than, than edited, cleaned up text. So that was, that's a failing of mine. I can't use a, a, a computer very well. And recently, and this is the story, I went back and started to paint. I painted for three years in the university, watercolors of imaginary birds. I got, it was a big show every year at Penn, including the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. And I got first prize for three years and then I stopped painting when I graduated. I often stop things abruptly. And I find that's very healthy for me. And uh, then I started painting again about eight or nine years ago. So it was 50 years I didn't paint. And uh, imaginary person and I filled up, I filled up, my walls are filled with my paintings, my imaginary bird, birds, all the same size because I bought a pad of rice paper in China when I was there. And then I ran out of film frames because uh, 
If I didn't like them, I crumbled them up and threw them away. And if I liked them, I framed them. I never sold one, never showed them anybody. I don't even give them away to my kids who want one of them. And um, I thought, well, I've never done sculpture ever in my life. And uh, I'll cut to the end of this very fast. So I started doing sculpture and it turned out okay. So I had them cast in bronze. And so I have about 20, 18, 19, 20. Rather, I really like, I think the sculptures, some of them are pretty good. Uh, some of them aren't so good. Some of the paintings are pretty good. Most of them aren't that great. Uh, but there's a museum in Carl Gables and the whole museum for three months is gonna have a show because by accident, the curator came here and they're gonna have a show in the whole museum filled is just gonna be my paintings and sculpture. Now I'm telling you that because I no longer identify with them so much and doing each one doesn't come from my abilities. It comes from my terror. That the beginning of everything I do, I begin a piece of sculpture, I get more in touch with my terror. Uh, and it's terrifying to do everything. I don't do it because I know how to do it. I do it because I don't know how to do it. And the result when it's finished no longer is mine. It's something that I observe. And I'm now interested in finding out something else that I'm interested in that really terrifies me. Uh, and I'll find something I know because I always have. And uh, so I have the confidence that I'll find something that terrifies me, that interests me. And I know that there's just two words that exist that has to do with our whole educational system. And they're all, they look like the same word, memory and memorize. Our whole system is the memorization of things we're not interested in. Bulimically, we throw them up on a piece of paper, it becomes a test. We either, we do X amount well on the test and then we forget it. But the other side is learning. We learn what we're interested in and we remember it. And what you remember is learning. What you have in your head that you've learned from your experiences and those that you will keep on getting that with, with sticky touches on to the cobweb that is your head. Your head is not a beautiful spider web. It's a cobweb. It's more efficient. And it touches all those things you can think of Rudolf Tanzi and put it together with in a story with that conference and what led it led to and this and that, all different things in that cobweb. I am fascinated with that cobweb. So I'm fascinated with the necessity that the world has for people who work vertically, keep on getting better and better and better at one thing, because that's where great things happen. And I belong to this group, which is not nearly as successful or as important to the world, but is much more interesting to live that life. I'm interested in nouns, N-O-U-N-S, kissing. Different sub, you brought up technology, entertainment, design. Three nouns, they kiss. To do good technology, it has to be use the entertainment business or to do design, you have to use technology. They all, they're one business. In order to do well, you don't have three conferences, one with just technologists, one with just entertainers and one with design. I mean, they have those conferences and they give awards. They get awards, fame, power, money comes from being doing one thing. But interest comes from nouns kissing. So, so I'm interested my, in kissing everything. My very special guest has been Richard Saul Werman. His latest project is the Werman Center for Understanding Understanding. And whether he agrees with me or not, whether he agrees with me or not, this has been one of the most spiritual conversations I've ever had <laughs> with somebody who doesn't consider themselves spiritual. So you said to me, now you're 86, I believe, right? 86? 86. I'm 74, getting to 85. <clears throat> Both you and I know our next chapter is going to be death. So yes. I am, uh, I know that you've written about death. You've written 90 books, so have I, but uh, you know, we are now 
facing that final chapter, you and I. Mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time every day reflecting on the great mystery of death, which is as big a mystery as birth. And I don't think uh, death and birth are, are contradictions. They're just uh, the dance of existence. Birth and death is the dance of existence. I personally am not at all terrified by death. I think death makes life possible. My last question to you is, what is your take on understanding the understanding of this final chapter? At the end of it, what does it all mean? And that we leave it there because we have less than five minutes. Otherwise we won't be able to post this on the, where I want to post it. Well, I'm gonna give you a silly answer but it's actually profound for me. Okay. I, I hope that my feet don't hurt anymore. Beautiful. It's that if it's possible, I would have, I would like to avoid the, often what comes with death, trails along with death is pain. I'd like to avoid pain. I might not. Uh, I would I would life like to avoid uh, the loss of my memory. And you see in this conversation what a good memory I have and how much dependent I am on my memory and how much I believe in memory, being learning and being life. My wife says, Richard would like to be a, a brain in a jar. And uh, so I, I look forward that the years can go that way. Not, I don't have fear because I know the inevitability. Uh, I don't believe in any continuation after death. Uh, that you might, or my spirit after death, or my influence after death, or a remembrance after death. I have no care about uh, that kind of legacy. Uh, it either happens or it doesn't happen. It doesn't, it, I, I just don't know about it. Uh, but I hope my feet don't hurt more. So once again, this is very profound, very spiritual from my <laughs> Well, I didn't think that was very profound and spiritual. I thought you would be offended. I thought you'd be offended by me talking about my feet, but it's the truth. No, your feet, your genitalia, your hair, your brain, there's no hierarchy. They all come from the same stem cell. And as far as learning and memory, I think I'm on the same page with you. We only remember what we were in love with, whether it was an idea or an adventure or a process. So there's no problem with memory, as long as you're in love with what you're doing. And I have no fear that you will lose your memory because you're in love with life. And that's all that matters. Now I invite you to call me on a Zoom call with no ask, no agenda, and no recording. And we have a chat. We will do that. Once again, very special guests. Uh, Richard Saul Werman, speaking about understanding. And if anybody wants to get in touch with them, you can give them my email address, it's fine. Why don't we do that right now? RSW, Richard Saul Werman, RSW at Werman, W-U-R-M-A-N.com. Thank you, sir.